Hey everyone, this is Belinda Carr. Welcome back to the Boost AEC podcast, where we dive into the world of construction and explore the stories of people and companies who are shaping the future of our industry. We've got yet another exciting podcast for you today. I'm speaking with Tessa Lau, founder of Dusty Robotics. Thanks for joining us, Tessa. Thanks, Belinda. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I came across your company about three and a half years ago. Or so that was a long time ago, and I was I made a YouTube video on. Um, your dusty robot, which which we can dive into the details a little bit later. But it is awesome to see how much you and your team have grown in the last three years. Like you are the talk of the town right now. Every company I work with knows about Dusty and has experiment with Dusty and is using it. So congratulations on how much you all have achieved. Thank you so much. We're it's super exciting to watch the progress. I'm amazed every day. Yeah. So for people who, the few people who don't know, haven't heard of Dusty, your company builds robot-powered tools for the modern construction workforce. Your most popular offering is the field printer that can reduce time and improve results out on in, out in the job site. Yeah. So let's dive into a little bit about that. When did you get started? When did you start Dusty Robotics? And why did you pick this particular uh, field of automation? Yeah. So I've been in robotics for about um, uh, 11 years now, uh, almost 12 at this point. And about five years ago, uh, I wanted to start my second robotics startup. And I uh, was looking around for ideas or of, of things to build and industries to impact. And I happened to be remodeling my house at the time. And so I saw construction for the first time. And coming from robotics, like my expectations that everything is automated, right? There's a robot that does this and that. And um, and when I saw construction, I was horrified by how inefficient it was because it's basically people using hand tools to build buildings. And so I thought there, there must be some opportunities for a roboticist like myself to come and create products that can impact the industry. And so I bought a hard hat and started exploring construction. And here we are. And I'm... I'm when I made the video on uh, Dusty Robots, I went into a little bit of your backstory and I looked into the company that you were founded and worked on before Dusty. And I, I don't know if this is true, but one of the statements I made, I remember saying this, it felt like that previous company tried to do a little too much. And when you started this, you identified one, one, potent, one aspect of construction that really needed help. And your robot honed in on that with extreme precision and and you've been able, that's why I feel Dusty is so successful because it's not trying to do everything. It's not trying to automate everything in construction. You're tackling one singular thing and doing it in a really good way. Yeah. One of the uh, failure modes for robotic startups is that uh, they want to build general purpose technology that does everything. Uh, and I point to humanoid robot companies as a really good example of that, right? They want to build robots that look like people that uh, can do anything. And the problem is that um, the technology is a little bit, it's not there yet to actually create human replacements. And so you end up not doing anything really well. And that lack of the market often kills the technology. So when we started Dusty, we wanted to create, we wanted to focus on the problem first the technology second. Obviously, it will be a robot and it'll be super cool and you know awesome, but um, we wanted to focus on what problem were we solving for the industry. And when I saw people on their hands and knees snapping chalk, chalk lines, lines. immediately <laughs> that chalk lines were something that should be better done by robots rather than people because of the precision and the repeatability that you need in order to um, bring detailed information out into the field to build correctly. So your company is based in San San Francisco, correct? Uh, we're actually in Mountain View, which Mountain. is about half an hour south of San Francisco. How large is your team now? Uh, we just brought another person on board. We are 65 people. Whoa. Oh, my yeah. gosh. I think you all were less than 20 back like four years ago. So that's impressive. Yeah. We've been growing really fast. So when when you build your team, what percentage of people do you look for that are outside the AAC industry, that coming from outside the AAC industry? Mm. Uh, I think of it the other way. I think about how do we hire as many people from the AAC industry as we can. Um, so uh, uh, 
one of the things we look for, for example, in our in our sales and customer success teams is people with prior construction experience. And so some of our most successful sellers are people who have been in the industry. Um, one of our re most recent AE hires uh, was a project manager for a construction company. And they bring their knowledge to bear every single day to help Dusty be better. That's, I mean, that's, that's, I was thinking more on the robotic side where you definitely need people who mean, the robotics and construction is not as developed. It is now, like it, people are getting more into it, but I would feel like good roboticists might be from outside the industry. But what you're saying is very valuable because those kind of people have, they know the task of bending over and snapping these chalk lines thousands and thousands of times and the toll that it takes on their body. So the story that they can tell is so powerful and it's so convincing when they're trying to convince clients or other construction companies to experiment with your robot and adopt this new technology. Yep. Our, one of our AEs was a superintendent for DPR construction and came up as a carpenter. And so he knows firsthand the pain of layout, both from doing it himself as well as seeing the problems when it's not done correctly. Yeah. Let's walk through the process of how your robot works all the way from the beginning with the models that you receive from architects or construction companies to the printing process. How does that, what's that workflow? Yeah, so we think of our solution as not just being a robot, but it's actually a hardware software um, services package that helps our customers level up their digital workflow. Um, and so what that means is that today you design a building, typically in Autodesk Revit. Uh, you print a lot of those plan shop drawings on pieces of paper, hand those pieces of paper to someone in the field, and that person in the field using measuring tape and string to actually dimension out and draw those plans on the floor so that people know what to build. What we're doing is creating a set of automation tools, including a robotic layout printer, that can automate that entire workflow as well as bringing information from the field back into the digital workflow as well. And so uh, today it starts with Revit, which is where our customers typically do their modeling. We have a plugin for Revit that allows them to automatically create the robot-ready detailing drawings that the people in the field want to see in order to build successfully. Uh, that from the, from Revit, our plugin exports to our portal. Uh, our we call it a construction management system or CMS. So the Dusty CMS is where you can track all of your jobs, um, store information about all of those jobs, do court do class detection and coordination through there, so that all the different trades that are participating can see everything on the same coordinate system and make sure everything lines up in one place before they actually go to print it. Um, we include the robot itself, which everyone has seen on YouTube by now. Uh, it's a, like a Roomba-sized robot. I think of it as a self-driving inkjet printer that can take a digital model and print it on the floor with 100% accuracy. Um, and that automates the process of taking all of these different coordinated uh, trades layouts together and in a single pass over the floor, print all of that detail down so that everyone who comes after it knows exactly what they need to build. There's no more conflicts. There's no more miscommunication about who's doing what on the floor. Okay. Um, and then after the robot comes through, we have uh, more reporting uh, software that gives you productivity statistics and lets you know how you did um, and track that uh, compared to how you've done on past jobs or how other companies are doing so that you can see how you're stacking up. Um, and then we're going to uh, we have lots of plans to expand out from there, but that's basically Without what we the have. product lines? Yes. Got it. So I have a question. So when architects and BIM modelers model in Revit, that's the digital side of it. And then y'all print, uh, y'all use all that data to print on concrete flows. That's another digital side of it. But there's a human component between that where humans are involved in pouring concrete, leveling all the concrete. And and as we know, when <laughs> humans are involved in stuff, things go wrong. Things are not always according to plan. There are going to be clashes. Walls are not poured in the right location. Footings are off by a foot. <laughs> so how, do, how, do your, how does your team account for that? Is there certain surveying done before that you print it? Or even during the printing process, there might be errors and you'll spot those errors and then convey it back to the designers? Yeah. So there's a couple different solutions there. 
Um, everyone knows that in construction, things can go sideways and, you know, not everything is what it should be. Um, one of the things we teach our customers how to do is that as they're operating our robot, we teach them how to cross check themselves. And so, for example, if you know that this wall that you're printing must line up with that existing core, then print that wall first and see if it lines up with your core before you print the rest of the layout on the floor. So to make sure that uh, the, the critical points are exactly where they need to be. Um, if they're not, then you've, we teach you how to fix that or, or different ways to address that problem so that when you do print the rest of that floor, everything lands in the right place. So you talked about teams handling the robot and issues themselves. So do you all sell these robots? You don't rent them out and you don't have teams that are monitoring the printing process? So we sell annual subscriptions. Um, so a subscription gives you access to one robot, which you can use on as many jobs as you want. And we teach you how to operate both the VVC and the robot itself. Um, and so that's what I meant by training. So our customers operate the robots. We don't provide the labor to actually use the robots to, to print the layout, but we teach you how to do that. I see. So how, what has the reception been like uh, by the AC industry? We talked about how much you have grown in the last four years, but on the field or on the job site, what do people think about the robot? What's the feedback you've received? We have some raving fans. Yeah. We have a lot <laughs> of raving fans out there. Um, and I think one of the things that I like to point to is the fact that our customers are so excited about adopting this technology that they post their own videos on social media or LinkedIn or other websites. Um, and so some examples of that, like just this morning, one of our customers, FL Crane, posted a video on LinkedIn of our robots printing a beautiful, beautiful soffit curve around a column. Uh, it's like a half circle, 180 degrees, perfect curve. Uh, the robot does it one, one smooth pass. And they are advertising that because they are proud of adopting technology that makes their teams better. Um, That's and so cool. they, yeah. So that's just one example. That's just today, that's right? Like, like leaving a five-star Yelp review, right? It's almost yeah, the same exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we have a whole host of customers um, all across the U.S. at this point that are just so delighted with our product and how it allows them to build better with technology that they are talking about it and they talk about it on, on social. They talk about it to their friends and that comes back to us and that's how we're growing. I've, have you considered growing internationally using some of these robots on international projects? Yes, we will eventually expand internationally. Uh, right now we are North America, so US, Canada, Mexico. Um, we have, even though it seems like we have a large team, uh, we have a relatively small team when it comes to supporting uh, international expansion. And so I'm asking our team to focus right now on just doing this well in, in North America so that we can make sure that everything is is uh, at the level of service and professionalism that we expect before we grow internationally. What version of the robot are you at right now? Like version 25, 125? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on how you measure it. We've, uh, we've made a lot of improvements to the product over the last six years that we've been in operation. Uh, actually on April 1st, it will be six years. So yeah. Wow, um, congrats. Yeah, that's a big birthday for us. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in some sense, uh, there's like a million different versions that we, because every, every um, it used to be that every single job we learned and we modified our hardware and software to perform better on the next job. Um, now we're settled into a more regular release cadence. Um, and so what we have deployed in the field, we call that our field printer. It's our, it's our first generation model uh we are we've announced uh our field printer 2 uh which is coming later this year uh we showed it for the first time at world of concrete i saw uh, it yep right <laughs> yep uh we will be at awci build in orlando uh in two weeks on uh march 26th i believe and 27th um, and that's showing our new field printer 2 which is our second generation robot very cool so early on in the uh, in the first like, two to three years when you when the first robot that you all made because what I what I see on your website is very different than the one that I showcased in my video four years ago but um what were the some of the hardest and most painful lessons learned in those early stages where you realized 
maybe we need to scale back or maybe we're not getting the problem or maybe we're tackling the this problem in a, in an incorrect way yeah so the best story i have there was um two winters ago we started seeing failures in the field it was like october and um robots were coming back to us with uh, reports of unpredictable behavior like they would um, behave inappropriately on job sites um and developed a mind of their own or something they, yeah exactly they were becoming sentient or something i don't know and and so we brought them back into the lab we tried to diagnose them um we we th we and and by uh, april we we finally thought we had the solution it was one of the parts that was coming loose it was a, a coupler that couples the motor to the wheel and when that comes loose then the motor would turn and the wheel would not right so you, if you think of like a, a coupling in a car right and and if you gas the engine and your car doesn't go forward there's a, a disconnect somewhere right that's that's kind of what was happening and so we fixed that coupler and all the problems went away and so we thought great we solved the problem um, and then the following October, the problem started happening again. And we're like, what is this? We thought we fixed this problem. Um, and so we brought the robots back into the lab and started debugging them again. And one of our engineers had the brilliant idea, let's let's put some robots in the fridge. And we would put the robot in the fridge, we would take it out, we turn it on, and it exhibited the problem. And so we thought, hmm, you know, maybe cold is a factor here. And it turned out that the coupler didn't actually solve that problem. It was actually an out of spec component on one of our um, off the shelf uh, uh, sensor boards that uh, was not correctly rated for that temperature. And so at 50 degrees or below it, it started generating garbage readings. Oh and gosh. so we discovered that it wasn't actually the coupler that was solving the problem, it was spring. And when the weather warmed up, we stopped seeing the problem and when the weather cooled down again, we started seeing the problem again. So we finally were able to solve that problem. But uh, that is my classic story of why hardware is hard. <laughs> wow. So this is pretty crazy. I just thought of something when you were talking about all of this. Is there a way that you can shoot points on ceilings by using your printer? Have you discussed that with your team? <laughs> that is a very common ask we get. Um, because so in layout in, in construction today, right, the vast majority of layout happens on the ground. Yeah. Uh, you mark the points on the ground, even if they're going to be installed overhead. And then you take a plumb laser, put it down on the ground on top of the point, shoot it up. And that's where you install web laser points, too. Um, and so our customers are like, can we save some time by like having the robot mark things on the ceiling? Um, we have some ideas. We have nothing. Using lasers, something etch little and, yeah. marks. Uh, well, I mean, the problem is we have to make it safe. Safe, I know. Yeah, I mean, if you have a laser that's like strong enough to etch something into the ceiling, you probably don't want to look at it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of constraints there and we haven't figured out a good solution yet, but we're thinking about it. So you talked about expanding your product line. What uh, do you, uh, are you at liberty to exp to share some of that information of, on some of the other um, hardware solutions that your team's developing? Mm. So a lot of the focus that we have lately is on software. So, um, and, and we have more hardware plant, but uh, nothing I can talk about yet. So on the software side, at the same time as we're announcing Field Printer 2, we're also announcing the release of our Field Print platform. And so that is a um, expanded software suite that includes a lot of the things that I already described. So the Revit plugin, the AutoCAD plugin, uh, the portal, the, or their CMS tool where people can collaborate on on coordination of trade drawings um, all of that is included as well as um, the reporting infrastructure that allows you to track your progress um, and so that's starting to become available oh um and and the other thing how could i forget that um, we've also upgraded the tablet that people use to operate our robot so our ta our, our robot is operated by a, a tablet which you load your AutoCAD or Revit drawings onto, and then you can use that to control the robot to tell it what to print and in what order and with what parameters and so on. And we just uh, are releasing a new version of that with uh, with uh, with an iPad interface, which is much easier to use than our previous interface. And it's actually cut our training time down from three days to one and a half days. So 
our customers can pick up the operation of the robot just much faster. It's much more intuitive and it makes it so easy to learn. So is it going to be an app on an iPad now rather than custom a custom i a custom uh, tablet like you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we uh, we ship the iPad as part of our solution. Okay. Uh, so our our total solution includes the laser tracker, it includes our robot, and includes the iPad, and all that comes together. The iPad comes preloaded with this app. It's already paired with the robot, so all you have to do is unbox it and start printing. I'm not sure if we can discuss this, but are there competitors out there that are trying to mimic what you all are doing? Because I remember seeing last year on LinkedIn, just ad popped up on my feed of a field printer that looks suspiciously like yours. Um, and I don't know how far advanced they are. And is like, how much of this is proprietary and you all have control over? Yeah. So we have a number of patents that actually cover a significant chunk of, our, of how our system operates. But there are some competitors out there. Uh, Hewlett Packard has their site print. Uh, that's one of our um, one of the bigger competitors and uh, Rugged Robotics also has an offering. Um, right now, I would say we're the market leader. We have the biggest market share. Uh, we have the best product. Obviously, I would say that. Um, I think the the reality is we've been in the market since 2020. That's when we did our first paying job and we've been getting better ever since. Um, HP just came to market last year. Um, and so, you know, we have a, a significant lead over them. Yeah. Lead over any of our competitors. Yeah. Um, but I think it's awesome that there are more people coming into the space because yeah. it really validates that we're on the right track, right? Exactly. There's something that can be done here. What are some of the memorable projects that you and your team have worked on? Uh, well, if you watch the Super Bowl this year, that happened at Allegiant Stadium. And uh, way back in, I wanna say 2021, we actually laid out one of the suites at what would become Allegiant Stadium. Oh, wow. That was the biggest project we'd done to date, uh, the biggest job. And it was it was an early uh, pilot with us, with Mortensen, but it gave us a chance to test out our product on a real world job site really early on. Uh, actually, that must have been probably 2019 now that I'm thinking about it. Um, well before we had like a, a, a production product. Yeah, because you talked about coming, um, the first robot was released in 2020. So this is even before that. Even before we had a production version, we had a prototype that we were starting to pilot on job sites. Um, and so that was back uh, early on. When we were able to get access to some really interesting jobs. And uh, we've done a lot of interesting jobs since. Uh, we've also done work on um, the Climate Pledge Arena up in Seattle. Uh, those are those two are our most notable stadium projects. Um, but most of our work is just more bread and butter. So we do a lot of data centers. We do a lot of hospitals, a lot of multifamily residential, a lot of office buildings. So just, you know, standard commercial builds. But there's a lot of them out there using Dusty right now. Is your, is your printer modular in a sense that can you retrofit older printers, use some of their parts, and then convert them into the newer printers? Uh, we did not design it to be modular because modularity comes at a cost and we're trying to keep costs contained while also providing the best value for our customers. And so what we're creating right now, our field printer too is an all-in-one unit. Uh, there's no user serviceable parts inside. All there is is a slot to put your battery in and out um, as well as replace the ink cartridges. And by doing that, we can give you the, the best experience with the most reliable components we can possibly build. Got it. Okay. Is there anything that I haven't touched on? I feel like we, you explained the printer really well, the projects really well, your hurdles that you overcame. We talked about how the product was received by, I feel like we touched on everything really fast. <laughs> yeah, we did. Um, the one thing that I did want to talk about is um, one of our focuses for this year is multi-trade layout. And um, I want to talk about that because we coined that term uh, back when we started. And now the industry has kind of like adopted it and is running with it. And it's it's becoming the expectation, to be honest. When people adopt Dusty, they're expecting me to use it for all the different trades. But that wasn't true when we started. When we started, each trade um, had their own ideas about 
how they would do layout. And so we started by working primarily with drywall companies doing drywall layout. Um, then we worked with a mechanical company, Southland actually, to do mechanical layout. Um, and it's only been after we were able to prove out the feasibility of automated layout with each of these individual trades that the GC started saying, oh, I guess that's working. That could really benefit me if you can lay out all of my trades information at the same time. And, and so we're kind of, I'm really uh, excited to see that conversation shift from how can an individual trader adopt Dusty to being with a GC or even we're working with some owners and developers now. Um, for example, the FANG companies that are building a lot of AI data centers, um, many of them are requiring Dusty on their jobs because of the benefits that automated layout brings to them. Um, better speed, better, less risk, you know, more predictable cost. Um, all of those things come from using more automation. And so uh, they are, um, both the GCs, the owners, the developers are all advocating for this multi-trade layout, which essentially started as nothing a couple of years ago and is now starting to become the predominant way that automated layout is getting used. This might be a silly question, but how do you distinguish between all those different layouts? Do you use different colors? Because at a certain point, you'll have to be careful about printing too much information on on the uh, floor. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. A lot of our customers uh, initially asked for different colors because that's how they do it today. Everyone has a different can of spray paint and they paint their points a different color than the other person. Um, so we can do that. Uh, we can print with multiple colors. Uh, unfortunately, it slows you down because uh, the robot can only hold one color at a time. And so we've come up with better ways of representing information. And one of the better ways we've come up with is that we actually print uh, lines with text in it. So instead of seeing just a straight line that has no label on it, and so you need to know what it is, uh, we print the word duct every foot along that line. And so you can be looking at that line and, oh, that's a duct. Oh, that's a conduit. Oh, that's a, you know, that's a pressurized pipe, right? And so as you're looking at that floor, you don't need those colors to tell you what you're looking at. And those are solutions that you all had to just come up with on your own because that's not the norm in the construction field right now. Exactly. We're we're basically inventing a new visual language for construction, right? So that anyone who walks onto a dusty site, um, we're we're proposing a certain like a set of line styles, a set of wording, a set of conventions that people use to actually represent the information so that you can go from one site to another and you can still understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And you'll obviously primarily work in, in the commercial field. There isn't a genuine need for printing all these layouts in the residential field yet. I, I would look into multifamily. We do a lot of multifamily. Do yes. Okay. I, I would I would put multifamily in the commercial bucket. Um, uh, residential construction is uh, the jobs are a lot smaller. Yeah. And so um, you know we'll probably enter that market at some point with a different offering, but the product that we have right now is really targeted at commercial. Okay, we've got to look out for those different offerings. We've we've touched on that a few times during this conversation. I'm excited to hear more about that when you all are ready to release it. Um, I I love the way you explain the product, the company. Thank you so much for sharing all that information with us. I do have one last question for you, and I try to ask all my interviewees this. What advice would you have for a young professional who wants to automate our industry, an industry that is still very old school, still so resistant to change. What advice would you have for them? Um, so one of the best books that I read uh, when I was founding Dusty is called Four Steps to the Epiphany. Uh, it's by Steve Blank. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's basically a guide to how to start a startup. Uh, you don't need to read the whole book, just read the first three or four chapters on how to come up with your original idea and how to talk to customers about it. Um, because that customer discovery process, that is key. Um, so I meet a lot of would-be founders who want to start a company. They have an idea. They, ha they, they have the, the desire to found something and, and create something. And they want to come into construction. And they, and they ask me, like, what should I build? Um, and my answer is always, look, I'm not going to tell you what to build. Um, because if I told you, I'd be wrong. Um, and I'm not from the construction industry, right? So what you should be really doing is 
interviewing a buttload of people from the construction industry. Talk to them, understand what their problems are, understand what their pain points are, where could technology help them, come in with an open mind, and don't try to assume that you understand the industry unless you've actually spent enough time in the industry to really understand it. That's what I did when I started Dusty, and it's paid a huge dividend since. So that's what I recommend all founders to do. That's excellent advice. Um, I have what you have built is is really truly impressive. Just I don't have many female people, females on the podcast, and I've been wanting to talk to you for the last four years. So thank you so much for sharing your story with me and for sharing your time. If you had to do this all over again, would you? I know this probably has been a, a painful experience with lots of long hours, sleepless nights, building the team has can't have been easy, but you have produced an amazing product that has truly been appreciated by the industry. So if you had to go back to six years ago, would you do this all over again? Absolutely. This has been some of the best six years of my life. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful, Tessa. Thanks again for sharing your story. And I'm looking forward to seeing what where Dusty Robotics heads and all the new offerings that you'll come up with. Absolutely. Super excited to share those with you as well when they become available. Yeah. Thank you for telling our story.